Welcome everybody to another exciting episode of Home Kid Insider. You've got me as always, Andrew O'Hara, and I have two special guests with me, both joining from the Thread Group, which should be familiar to a lot of our audience out there. I have Jonathan Hui and Sujata Nidig. I hope I got both those spot on correct, but thank you both for joining me today. Thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah, excited to be here. I know, I'm excited. There's, we still have more CES news to break down. Like there was more from the last episode. The Red Group actually had some CES news that we talked about too, that I'm pretty excited to kind of dig into, into more details and ask you guys some questions about it. Um, but before we get into all of the Thread and other connectivity talk, let's go ahead and um, hit some news articles for the week. So first off, uh, this is not as relevant to HomeKit Insider audience, but we got to talk about it for at least two seconds. Vision Pro is available for pre-order, uh, already for pre-order by the time that everyone has watched this. Are you guys, either of you, in the market for Apple's Vision Pro headset this time around? Not quite yet. <laughs> But it is enticing. Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting to me. I don't know if I'm ready to jump in, but you know, I know on, on the latest iPhone 15, there's a way to start recording video in a, to, to su support uh, spatial video, right, on, on the Vision Pro. So I'm, I'm going to start recording at least and getting con personal content around. Um, I think yeah. that's a good recommendation for most people: is just start recording it. Start recording in spatial. Because you never know. Whether it's one or two years away, Apple's going to have a low-cost version. They definitely see this as a mass market space. So I'm sure they will come out with something more affordable. But uh, until we get one in our hands and actually try and find out what we can do on the smart home side of things, let's get into some smart home news. We have a few items that I did not touch on in last week's episode. So first up, there's another Find My enabled case on the market. So this is from a company called Upfiner. And I think it's a French company because it's in the French tech section of Eureka Park, but they say they have it launching later this year, and it's basically a little plastic case that you can take with you that has built-in support mm -hmm. for Apple Find My. And what I thought was kind of an, a unique idea on this, like as a security case, you can actually press the buttons on it. Uh, it's got like a keypad, and it will lock it, and then it'll like arm it. And if somebody goes to move it, a siren will start going off. So that was kind of a neat idea in terms of like a protective case to take with you for medication or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, with native support for Find My. We've got um, some more Qi 2 chargers. So Sateki had two new Qi chargers coming out. I mean, you guys know about launching brand new standards. So Qi 2 is a big topic at CES yeah. this year. Um, there's two different models. One is a three-in-one, one is a two-in-one. They almost kind of look like an Apple display stand. Um, like it's like a very flat and rounded kind of at the bottom, almost like a Pro Display uh, XDR or Apple Studio Display, but with a G2 charger on the top. So we have two of those. GE has a whole new lineup of devices and they are really going in on matter. And I will tell both of you, I've been telling GE for years because they even launched with Bluetooth, like low energy or whatever. And I was like, why are you doing this? We have Matter coming out. Why are you not going with Thread? And they didn't do it still, but at least they switched to Wi-Fi, I believe, for a lot of these things. But now they're finally on the Matter bandwagon with a bunch of different ones. Um, and a couple we'll talk about towards the end of the episode that are going to be especially poignant. But there are like light bulbs, there are can lights, there are switches, all the stuff that'll support Matter. Uh, then finally, Nanoleaf has new matter-enabled products. They have a new multiple addressable zone light strip that has just RGBIC support. There's a new orchestrator software to sync your music. And then there's like a string light, pendant light that hangs down. Uh, it's more of a pendant light, I would call it. But colors, brightness support, everything. And then they have permanent outdoor lights. So I think I mentioned like one of those on the last episode, but I didn't talk about the pendant lights. So I kind of wanted to call out those again alongside their other products. So did you guys see anything else at CES that you guys were excited about in terms of like smart home tech? Yeah, I mean, I, I was there very briefly, did not get to go around and see everything that I wanted to see, but it is, it's nice to see more Matter products and how they can bring unique experiences to users. And um, that there were, I think over a hundred booths 
that had some sort of matter of product inside of it. And so to me, that was really exciting. And, and it felt like smart home is really becoming more of a reality instead of a look what might be possible in the future. Uh, so those were really the key takeaways that I had. And I've not had time to digest all the CES news yet. I was already traveling yet again this week. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it clearly took a while. Jonathan, did you see anything, whether in news or I don't know if you were on the show floor at all? No, I, I didn't make it to the show floor, but I, I was tracking uh, the news. And um, yeah, certainly to Sujata's point, I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of interest around Matter. I, I think, you know, compared to last year, you know, last year was the launch of Matter. So it's, it's hard to compare, right, to that. But, um, you know, certainly there was a, a lot of mentions of Matter that I saw um, and, and, you know, through colleagues that were on the show floor. Um, you know, from a threat perspective, yeah, I think it was interesting to see, you know, a, a couple of options for door locks coming out, right? I think uh, even even just a couple of months ago, we were, you know, we were starting to hear questions about, hey, you know, where's threat in the door locks? And now you're starting to see them show up. So, so I think that's a great sign. Um, and then, you know, just a, a, a few other products, like from Akara and others, right? Yeah. Uh, that we were I was going to say that too. We were all excited about the Akara product. That's a smart plug with border router functionality. Yeah, yeah, and, and really seeing, you know, Akara had launched a couple of things last year, but, you know, I think this year they're really starting to show that, that they're, they're really diving all in, into matter. Yeah, they've been definitely doubling and tripling down on that. I like their smart plug that acts as that border router, as you mentioned, but also I'm excited for that Hub N3, because not only does it have thread built in, but they say it's like the first one that exposes the IR blaster to Apple oh, yeah. Home. So like anything you connect or control with that IR blaster will show up in the Home app. That's going to be kind of cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, one piece of less cool news that I had heard at CES. So I had this confirmed by a couple people um, without going into brands. But I was told that Apple has discontinued its HomeKit router program. So they're like, of course there's like a router that works with HomeKit in terms of like supporting your network. But then there's like an app, actual like router HomeKit spec where you can like control where devices have access to like on your home network, uh, between different devices or outside of your network. And we had only seen a couple routers that supported it, including like an Eero router, the Linksys router, maybe one or two others, but there hasn't been anything else in that space. And when I was pressing some of the companies at CES, they said like, oh, we can't even submit pro pro uh, products anymore. Apple's disbanded that section of, of Apple Home, which I was a little bummed by uh, that Apple is taking that away. I mean, I, I don't know. What do you guys think? I feel like it's also kind of like a, a nebulous space of like, what really does that do and is it worth it? But I, people kept asking us about HomeKit routers. Now we kind of have a, an unofficial answer about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, from, you know, you know certainly, certainly Apple saw value in trying to drive uh, certain technologies into the router market. Um, uh, you know, and I think the challenge they saw, right, was getting the router manufacturers to adopt um, the HomeKit router uh, profiles. Um, and, you know, the, the, the set of devices out there, right, that, that have that support are, are a bit limited. So, uh, you know, I, I think what they're seeing is there's opportunities in other places to, to start driving that uh, through a more standardized way, right? Um, you know, through Thread Group, for example, you know, uh, certainly some of the stuff that, were, that we announced as part of this uh, CES, but also just in general, right? Thread border routers have a if you look at it, it actually has some of the functionality that was in, in the HomeKit router stuff, right? So, um, you know, some of the privacy options and whatnot are, are included as part of thread border routers. Now that's specific to thread border routers, but you can kind of see that, you know, um, you know, th there are other forums uh, for, for driving these uh, technologies uh, across the industry. That's true. And we're definitely gonna circle back on the new, um thread and its internet connectivity stuff and where privacy comes into play there. So um, as far as uh, continuing with news, our audio speaker Kef, K-E-F, has a new, more affordable version of its LSX2 routers, or not routers, I'm talking about routers, uh, speakers. These are speakers. 
I love the LSX2 speakers. If you guys have ever seen them, they just look so sleek and cool. And now they have a new version. So it's like the LSX2 LT, like a light version. So both speakers are now connected together. Uh, you can't run them like both wirelessly. They have a couple other small design uh, changes to them to make them a little bit more affordable. So now they're like uh, under $1,000. But they uh, do support AirPlay. So they'll show on the home app and all their other good things like that. Um, we talked about Find My a little bit. Apple has doubled the capacity of Find My items in the Find My app. This was huge. I hit this very quickly. I don't know how much you guys use Find My, but uh, like the 16 or something you had before, it quickly would get eaten up if you started, you know, sticking air tags on things. So now it's up to 32. So that is very much appreciative, especially now that you can share things. Because I don't know how that came into play. Right? If my wife shared one with me, is that counting another one of my items and one of hers? I'm still not 100% on that. <laughs> Let's see. We have, um, I sent you guys, I think I sent you guys the link to this, so I don't know if you had clicked on it. There was a MagSafe prototype that had gone around that looked very interesting. Uh, and it looks like this was like the original design back from March of 17 before MagSafe was ever even announced. But I'm a huge MagSafe person, and it has like a, it's, they say it's the same material that was used on like air power before that was killed off. And it was like rounded more. And it was like a soft back versus the metal back. Um, if you clicked on, if you looked at the pictures, what do you think of that old design versus the existing design that we see now with MagSafe? I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm kind of mixed on it. Uh, the original design certainly looks like more of a kind of a, a lollipop kind of, you know, kind of a more... I don't know, childish kind of thing, but but and whereas the the current one looks a lot more industrial, um, in terms of you know, you know with the metal round edge, um, looks more robust. Uh, you know, I, I could see advantages of both. The uh, the earlier one being a lot softer and maybe a more approachable in uh, certain ways. Um, yeah, I think approachable is a good word for it. It it does look almost more like a kind of like it reminds me of like the the old mouse that Apple had that was like round. Oh, yeah. In terms of, like, yeah, <laughs> kind of gives me those vibes. Um, yeah. But, yeah, which is interesting to see. I love, like, that kind of, like, behind the scenes on the technology and the development process. So we're, we're many years later from when uh, that was developed or when MagSafe came out. But still very cool to see. Okay, two quick more pieces of news. First alert, they were uh, acquired a, a little bit ago, and there was a lot of questions on whether or not they were sticking around in terms of the Apple home space. And we had even heard, uh, we had, I think, two people write in saying that they had spoken to customer support at first alert. And they were saying that products like the Safe and Sound and their smart smoke detector CO alarm had been discontinued and that they were going to be able to send them like a replacement product as like a, a dumb product. Um, without the connectivity options, which is kind of crazy. Like, you spend, like, a couple hundred dollars on, like, that first alert safe and sound, and their option was we can send you a standard plug-and-play dumb smoke detector. It seems absurd, but I actually spoke with them at CES, and they said that is absolutely not the case. First alert is sticking around. The Apple Home products are sticking around, including the safe and sound. So still built-in AirPlay speaker and everything. It's still going to be around on the market. So if anyone was questioning those, anything like that, that's our update. That's what I've been able to find out for you guys. Um, finally, we just talked about them a second ago, Acara. Acara yeah. has launched several products here into Best Buy, uh, or at least BestBuy.com. There's the G4 doorbell, the U100 door lock, the FP2 presence sensor, Hub M2, the P1, or P2 and T1 door and window sensors, T1 humidity and temperature sensor, water leak sensor, and wireless mini switch uh, T1, all available through Best Buy, at least.com, here in the States. So that's pretty cool. I love seeing like more of the expanded availability on these products, and a lot of those use Thread. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they're an early adopter of Thread. Well, I feel like we should get into the Thread talk. That's why you guys are here, and we have a lot of things to talk about. But before we get into all the thread stuff, we got to take a break. Thank our sponsor for this episode. You guys know, you have heard me talk about it before. It is Shopify. 
Shopify. It is basically the platform that you need for your business if you're trying to sell stuff online, whether it is digital goods, whether it is physical goods. And the thing that I love is that it hits like every stage of the business from absolute startups that know very little to these massive companies. I think it's something like 10%, yeah, 10% of all e-commerce is done via Shopify or is powered by Shopify, which I think is is amazing. And as far as like Apple users go, all the benefits here, so there's like a shop app, so you can make a purchase through and then it'll go to the shop app where you can track your purchase the rest of the way from that ordering process to fulfillment to it's at your door. You can even leave like reviews through that shop app. When you have a Shopify payment process, it makes it really easy because they have support for things like Apple Pay built in. So you can just breeze through that checkout process. So it's good for everyone from whether you're building your website or you're trying to make a purchase through a Shopify enabled website. So if you have not already, you probably shop through a Shopify website, but if you're looking at what to power your e-commerce platform, give Shopify a shot. So sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash home kit, all lowercase. So go to shopify.com slash home kit now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash home kit. And that's where like a cash register sound goes off. Like ching, like we'll, we'll pretend we got sound effects going on for our podcast here. <laughs> so let's get into thread. Um, before we start, why don't you guys tell me a little bit about um, your background and what you guys do with a thread group. And then we'll kind of, uh, if you want to recap our thread announcements that you guys made for CES. Yeah, sure. I'll get started and then I'll hand it over to Jonathan. So I I work at NXP Semiconductors. I'm a, a product manager, product marketing manager at NXP, focused on Internet of Things and wireless connectivity. And because of that, I, I've been in the wireless connectivity business since Thread was founded 10 years ago. Um, NXP is a member of Thread Group, and Thread Group is an industry standards organization. So. It's a nonprofit organization that companies from across the industry gather and work on developing, deploying, maintaining, upgrading the thread technology and the thread spec and the certification program. And, and we're one of the um, companies on the board of directors. So for Thread Group, my role has been as um, being on the board of directors and driving the direction and strategy for Thread Group and also the um, VP of marketing for Thread Group. So all of the marketing efforts that you see, I coordinate with lots of um, inputs and uh, resources from the member companies whose employees are contributing their expertise and knowledge to the effort. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and just give you a brief overview, high level of what we announced, and then I'll turn it over to Jonathan to go into what he does, and we can dig into a little more of the look under the hood of the, the announcement, per se. Um, so as you mentioned, Andrew, Thread has been growing. There are more products in the market um, today, and it, start, it started with HomeKit. We had more, HomeKit kind of drove the initial spur of Thread-based products in the market, and now we see Matter driving it to the next level. Um, and as we have seen products get deployed, our member companies have come back with ways of building on what we've already deployed and delivering uh, even better experience for consumers who are adopting Thread and product manufacturers who are building products and deploying them. And so with what we announced is the uh, enhancements that we'll be releasing this year, most likely the first half of this year, and all of these enhancements were uh, defined and developed to make Thread even more reliable, even more scalable, uh, and there's six categories. Um, so I'll just run through them very quickly, and then we can hone in on whichever ones you are most interested in talking about for your audience, Andrew. Uh, what One of the ones we've seen everybody be really excited about is credential sharing. And so what that enables is it enables when the new thread device is being onboarded into your house or added to your thread network, it will check to see if there's already a border router available. And if so, it can share its credentials with the existing border router and join the existing network mesh network instead of building its own mesh network so prior to this um, thread did not define how to do credential sharing it was left up to companies uh, but the feedback we got clearly from the market was that having a standardized way of doing this would simplify and um, facilitate it to be deployed sooner than later 
Um, so that's a key one. Another one is around providing internet connectivity directly from a device. Uh, and this is really designed to enable devices to leverage um, services that are cloud-based. So to be able to go through the border router and access information in, in the cloud or services. It, it could be software updates to the device. It could be things like the current weather and using that data point towards delivering an experience. And, and I'm sure Jonathan can come up with even more examples, but at a high level, that's what it's intended to do. Um, the next category was also something that is really exciting is network diagnostics. So what Thread is doing is implementing a way that every device in the Thread network will have information about it, accessible, um, you know, the type of device it is, the role it plays in the network, where it is in the network, all kinds of information. And this will enable product manufacturers to do more debug and scaling Thread networks. Um, before they deploy devices, it helps installers be able to build into the apps that are provided to them a way of when they're doing large installations, if there is some sort of hiccup, they'll have more visibility and be able to correct it without, um, it potentially even be able to correct it through a, a, a virtual appointment with the homeowner and not having to actually send someone out there. And for consumers, you know, it, it'll depend on the product manufacturers and what they want to put in their app and what visibility, but it will enable especially techie consumers who really like to see what's under the hood, it'll give them that access. Um, and then the fourth category is what we call thread over infrastructure. And the idea behind thread over infrastructure is just to strengthen the mesh by using existing connections in the home. Every home has ethernet and Wi-Fi connections. And so as thread devices build their thread mesh network, uh, what they're now be able to do is leverage these other IP connections and put the thread packets on those so that it provides a wider cast of the mesh uh, and, and allows extended coverage. And then another key um, enhancement really driven by the smart building um, member companies is commissioning, secure commissioning at scale. And what this allows is today, if you've bought a thread device, you can use a QR code and scan the QR code. But in large buildings, when devices are installed hundreds at a time, pre-installed into buildings before they even have power, and then the installer comes and turns them all on, having to take their phone and go to every single device and do a QR code scan is cumbersome. So with this feature, it enables a different way of exchanging the information that's needed securely by using authenticated um, TLS and uh, provide a way so that the person doesn't have to be right next to the device with the phone. So those are the major enhancements. There's a, a category of other just optimizations that you see in almost every kind of software release. You're doing slight bug fixes or enhancements. And I know that with a lot of information, so I'll pause and let Jonathan introduce himself and then we can dive into whichever areas are most interesting to you. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, that was, that was a great overview. Yeah, so just so everyone's aware, um, my name is Jonathan Hui. Uh, my day job is a principal software engineer at Google, um, leading a lot of the low power wireless technologies within Google, but uh, primarily focused on smart home consumer applications. Um, uh, so as part of that role, I, I serve within the Thread Group. Uh, I am a, a board representative from, from Google within Thread Group, uh, but also uh, serve as VP of technology within Thread Group, uh, leading the technical activities uh, within uh, Thread. So, you know, any uh, of the uh, work that is to specify the network protocols and uh, uh, you know define how devices talk to each other. That's that's the technical uh, work that we do. Um, I, I think it's also worth mentioning both Sujata and I uh, serve uh, as a board director for CSA. Uh, which is the, the body that, that runs uh, Matter, um, and we represent our uh, relative companies within CSA there as well. Nice. Awesome. Well, that was a great overview of everything. So I think there's the two biggest ones that uh, our audience is probably going to care about, like out of the gate, which is one, the internet connectivity one, um, and then the the shared credentials, as you guys had mentioned. So for the internet connectivity ones, like I've, I've I think we heard a couple like they'd be able to pull like 
weather mm -hmm. or stock price and then be able to like display that information or do something. Um, could you guys walk through how we're going to see that that implemented on the consumer side to limit you know that communication? So if you didn't want that device to go out and hit a cloud server, especially now that we may not have HomeKit routers, how is that going to get protected and that you don't have your home device necessarily talking to to something else if you do not want it to? Yeah, I could, I could talk to the technical aspect of it. Um, on uh, So as, as part of the specification, so we define how devices uh, are able to communicate to the internet, right? And the thread border router plays a very important role in being able to connect the two sides uh, between the thread network and uh, what is effectively uh, the internet connectivity through your home Wi-Fi and then ultimately through your ISP. Um, as part of that specification, we also define how to disable that uh, feature, right? And so um, just like your home router, uh, by default, the thread border router will provide that internet access today. But that, at the same time, we require thread border router uh, products to provide users the option to disable that functionality. So if they say they don't want their devices talking to the public internet, they can they can turn that off. And, and I think you see that feature in a number of other you know routers today where they can say uh, block access for a given device or you know whole set of devices. And so uh, we're we're making that a mandatory option uh, in thread border routers going forward. Okay, so here's another. This is a you know a theoretical question. So basically, we were, we're we would see essentially some sort of UI element within like the home app or something that would give you like a toggle of to limit that access. Is that kind of what we'd probably end up seeing? That's probably what we'll see. Uh, um, you know, Thread specifies how the network protocol operates, but when it comes to exactly. Uh, how that's presented to the user, uh, whether that's through an app or you know some web UI or something like that, uh, that that's really up to the product manufacturer. But yeah, uh, I think for like Google, for example, it, it would show up as an option within the Google Home app. Uh, you know, Apple, I think naturally would put it somewhere in the Home app. Um, uh, but that's you know that's just me guessing. But uh, um, yeah. So. Um Looking at it a little bit more too, one of the things that I, I know I hear a lot of from people is like with soft, software updates, at least on the, the Apple home side, are annoying. Because you always need, like nine times out of 10, you need that manufacturer app. Do you think now that we have like direct access to the internet, is it gonna be possible that we're gonna be able to get like more software updates enabled through like the Apple home app? Or do you think we're still gonna need more third party apps for that? Uh, no, so certainly the public internet access provides uh, an option for devices to directly reach out and do software updates. So I, I think with that feature in place, we'll see a handful of products um, you know, implement that option and, and be able to retrieve software updates uh, more quickly uh, without having to rely on uh, you know, the user uh, opening some app right, uh, on their phone or, or having some hub-like device installed in their home to, to distribute that. Um, you know, I, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, you know, Matter also has its uh, software update mechanism. But as we know, Matter is a, a local only protocol. So, uh, you know, that software update mechanism does require a hub within the home that supports that software update service. Um, but as, as that feature gets uh, rolled out uh, across the various uh, hubs and, and um, the Matter hubs and Matter controllers, uh, we should be able to see you know, other, I would say, vendor independent ways of getting software updates uh, to those devices. So, you know, what you're gonna see is there's gonna be a handful of options, right? Like the, the public internet access is is great because the vendor can control, you know, directly talk to the devices and provide those updates. But, you know, as I mentioned before, the user may decide, I don't want my devices talking to the public internet at all. And so that's where the, the local option becomes important. and. You know, Matter provides us a vendor independent way of doing that, but also, you know, I guess the vendor could still choose to, to provide a vendor specific way as well. Okay. Um, so looking at shared credentials, this is such a murky area in a lot of ways. Like how do, how do people even know right now if they're running 
multiple thread networks. I mean, like, for example, like I got, you know, NanoLeaf uh, equipment set up here. It's all technically in, M in Apple Home, but it's also Matter enabled. Like, are these on the th same thread network as like my, my HomePods or like with the new Acara one, would that be creating its own or is that going to be connecting? How do people know what, what networks they have and whether they not they even, you know, worry or care about this or is it going to be more across ecosystems like my Apple Home stuff working with my Samsung smart things um, that I'm also running? Yeah, I think in general today users don't really know uh, if they have one thread network or multiple thread networks. Um, a lot of that has to do with just um, the, the solutions today generally don't provide that visibility, right? Uh, to, to control their thread networks. Now, you know, there are some exceptions, right? Uh, the EVAP has a way to visualize uh, some amount of your thread network. Uh, I think NanoLeaf's app yeah, also has a way to um, visualize it as well. Um, but but those are limited to those those the set of devices that uh, uh, for those vendors. Um, I, I think it's worth mentioning that. You know, just because you have multiple thread networks in your home doesn't mean those thread devices won't work. Uh, they can actually, because it's all based on internet protocol, devices in different thread networks can still communicate with each other, but they just have to do it over, you know, over the Wi-Fi as well, right? So they'll have to go through the thread border router of network one and then over Wi-Fi to the other thread border router of network two. Um, so, you know, they, in, in many cases, like I said, the, the user won't know, and, and in many cases, the, it, it will just work for the user. Um, but there are limitations, right? Like, if I if those two different thread border routers are are apart, and I, I move a device from you know network one to net, to to somewhere closer to network two, then it, all of a sudden it looks like it doesn't communicate anymore, right? So so there are situations where um, that becomes evident. But you know, in many situations, if I'm setting up a a door lock or you know a light bulb i'm not going to be moving those devices around and if i'm able to successfully set them up then that typically means they're going to you know work uh uh you know for the user um but yeah I, you know in general we want to support scenarios where the user really wants a single thread network as you know it, it adding more as you add more devices to the thread network it becomes more robust uh more reliable um and so we do want to encourage, you know, the, the deployment of a single thread network rather than um, multiple thread networks. So is it like even like so? Do I do I do I have multiple thread networks? Like because I don't even know. Because <laughs> even when I look through like the Eve one, like am I am, would I assume that like my smart things is running on a separate thread network right now compared to my Apple Home stuff? Yeah, probably uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think if, right. you, if you're I mean, using, everything works fine, but yeah, that's the thing. So uh, the only way you can tell, like I said, is is if you opened up your Eve app or um, NanoLeaf app. I, I think uh, another way you could tell, but this is more for the technically savvy, is um, because we're using standard internet protocols. Uh, the border routers are discoverable over. Um, DNS service discovery, or, or what was Apple calls Bonjour, right, in the, in the past. Um, and so if you have a, a Bonjour browser or a, a device discovery browser, I think Safari has that, um, then you're, you're able to view um, the set of thread border routers on your network and, and the information that they have. Uh, and you can, through that, you can see whether they're on the same thread network or not. Okay, very interesting. Um, okay, and one other random question that I had that's like partially probably related to a little bit to this, but um, I'm not asking you guys to speak in any way for the companies, but just to kind of speculate why we're seeing some of this, which is um, we're seeing a lot of companies that are like, when they're launching Thread, a lot of them are choosing to do like Thread and Matter at the same time, even when they could have launched Thread first. And the example that I pull up of this is that like, we've talked on the show a few times is like the level lock. So it, it has that level lock radio and or that has the Thread radio in their door lock, they were able to confirm, but they're not enabling it until they have matter support. And while those are usually kind of talked about together, they don't have to be. So is there, what would you guys speculate reason that we're seeing companies not launch with just thread when they could do that kind of now and they want to do thread and matter together 
down the line. Because as an Apple Home user, like I would, we would benefit from that even without the Matter support. I would just like to have Thread because it's going to give me a better signal strength to that door lock than the Bluetooth does now. I think it would be faster uh, in how it responds sometimes. So why do you think we're not seeing that? And do you think any of the changes that you guys announced here uh, this year are going to maybe change it at all? Or do you think they're still just going to be coupled together? Well, that's a great question. And, and I don't think there's a one answer that fits everybody. But, you know, working at NXP, we're a semiconductor company. We work with, I work with a lot of customers. And, you know, every company has their own um, strategy of, and their unique product portfolio. Like some companies build the whole ecosystem of smart home devices. Some companies focus on one aspect of it. And if they've been in the market and they have brand recognition and they've got a portfolio already out there, they have a lot of considerations as they migrate. They, they, they probably really believe that IP using internet protocol will give them a path to be providing the best experience to their consumer, but they have to do it in a, in a strategic way because consumers don't buy a single device to be a smart home. You know, they're, they're having, it has to work with everything else. So I think that they have concerns about how do they make this migration in a seamless fashion? And then I think it also takes, um, you know, energy to adapt new technologies. If you've got an existing technology already implemented and deployed and it works well, it takes a while to make sure you get the resources to invest in the new technology and not just implementing it, but ensuring that it provides the same, at a minimum, the same experience that products you have on the market already do. For new companies, um, for startup companies, we see that they almost always select Thread. Like 2.0 is an example that does the smart buttons. And when they were building the concepts for their products and looked at the technologies available, they right away they said they saw Thread and they're like, this is perfect. Like This is better than what we would be able to get with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And so they're able to, but they didn't have, they're starting from ground zero and creating their brand and their products. So, um, so I just think that there's a lot of factors involved and it takes time for companies to move direction with their roadmaps. But I spoke to a company at CES last week who um, made the decision last year to move everything to their whole product portfolio to matter over thread and Wi-Fi. And they were using other technologies before and they're committed to bringing it out over time, but they want to make sure they do it in a way that doesn't give them dings, you know, from a consumer um, awareness perspective. Uh, Jonathan, yeah. I don't know if you have a perspective from the, being a platform provider company. Yeah, no, I, I mean, one thing I'll say is, um, you know, Thread just provides a way to, you know, send messages, right? Yeah. Uh, you still need that application layer that defines how those messages are, are you know, uh, what, what's the format of those messages and, and how they're interpreted. Um, you know, certainly, I. Anyone could just say, I'm going to define my own application layer, but that in itself is, is a bunch of work. Uh, and if you look at a lot of existing technology providers, right, if, if I wanted to go and build a product today and, and I'm really into Thread, uh, well, there's solutions today that do say, you know, I can buy um, technologies, uh, you know, packages that are HomeKit over Thread, Matter over Thread, right? Th those are like pre-baked solutions that, that make it a lot easier for me to, to build those products. But when I say, I don't want to do Thread or HomeKit, then I got to kind of do that additional work as well. So I, I think that's why you're seeing yeah. the bundling, just the supply chain is, is set up that way. Yes, that's a good point. And I think that's a really um, valid point to expand on. You know, Thread, we're, Thread Group is focused on how to best connect devices in a reliable, low power way. And it needs another technology on top of it to, you know, Jonathan said, it more eloquently, but I'll just say to speak the same language. Um, and and so, you know, matter is a new technology, so that's also a factor that they want. Companies want to have thread plus matter be more mature, and then they'll start adopting it. But I think it's happening more behind the scenes than we realize. It just, you know, bringing products to market um, takes time. And so I'm, I'm excited and, and think that over the next year and 12 to 18 months, we'll see a really large proliferation and with the enhancements that we've made i think it's just a sign that thread is growing in adoption because the types of enhancements there these are not like 
complete new use cases or, or, or anything like that. This is just about making it stronger and, and more reliable. Absolutely. I mean, I just think from an Apple user point of view, I'm like in the ha home, home kit space, Apple home space, and in my experience so far, Thread is typically much more reliable than Bluetooth. So when I have a product that I already have installed that has a Thread radio in it and they're not turning it on, I'm like, please? Yeah. Like, I don't, the matter part, like, you know, doesn't really change much in my, you know, situation. I just want the connectivity part. Yeah. It's like, I, I want the one and I don't need the other. It gets fine. But I, I want the connectivity part first. I feel like it would be better. But. And it, as yeah. you highlight this and other people do, you know, I think that brings awareness to companies that what consumers want is this, you know, better experience and Thread's going to provide that better experience. So. The power of the consumer. Well, uh, before we turn to listener questions, is there anything else you guys want to touch on on Thread? Anything you want to go through um, at all from the announcements or looking forward? No, Jeff, I think we went through them. If, if For people to really read through the details, you can go to threadgroup.org, and under the blogs you'll see the announcement so you can get it in written format. And these are all in development, and companies that are members of Thread Group are actually working on them already. So we expect to release them publicly um, by the middle of the year, and working to then help member companies deploy those enhancements to their products um, as soon as possible after it's available. I guess that, yeah, that would be a huge part right there is availability on all these updates. So, uh, mid-year to release them and then we'll see products trickle out after that uh i have to hope and imagine from an apple side we'll see things dropping with a uh, you know hum homepod update 18 and tvos 18 as far as the thread side goes actually now ios i forgot ios now has a yeah. iphone 15 series has thread yeah. radios and everything built in um what do you guys make of that i mean I, that's a cool thing we haven't really talked about that too much on the show uh you know how how has that gone? What do you think of use cases for something like that? Uh, yeah, give me your take on uh, iPhones adding Thread Radio. Yeah, this is a um, something that Jonathan is very passionate about. But we were really excited to see it, uh, the news happen. And um, within the member meet, our last member meeting, we had lots of conversations around use cases, potential use cases. And I think just the fact that it's in the phone, that everybody has a phone with them and carries with them everywhere. In, even in the home, the phone is usually not very far from, from you, right? And so it, it really does open up a lot of um, opportunities. Um, and, and we're excited to see what member companies dream up and, and want to implement. But I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to give some of your ideas or what we've you've collected oh, yes. so far. Certainly, uh, thread and thread and phone has has really been uh, exciting developments um, for me as well. Uh, you know, as Su Sujata mentioned, it's it, it now brings the thread radio kind of with the person, but uh, also outside the home, right? Uh, before, you know, thread devices were kind of yeah, I can make them, but they're they're tethered to the home, right? Uh, and you know, to be fair, thread was originally conceived because of smart home applications, but. Uh, I think people are seeing a lot of value in having Thread uh, provide connectivity options, um, you know, not just inside the home, but also outside the home as well. And, you know, you can imagine this, you know, Bluetooth and, and cellular and Wi-Fi, you know, they're all used in ways outside the home as well. And, and I think Thread just provides another interesting opportunity uh, for those devices to, to connect. Um, uh, yeah, so so there are a number of applications there. Um, I think both in consumer and enterprise commercial spaces, uh, uh, it makes interesting opportunities. Um, so yeah, re really excited to see uh, kind of where that takes thread. Cool. Well, uh, let's round this out. A couple listener questions. So this is a funny one because it, we had a perfect product launch at CES, but we had talked about it on I think uh, one or two episodes ago. Someone was asking for under cabinet lights which personally I think are some of the best smart lights in your home. Like when I go to a house that doesn't have like lights underneath their kitchen cabinets, I'm like, how do you see what your hands are doing? It's so dim. Um, but we had, I'd recommend, I just use light strips. I just use like my Hue light strips. Hue motion sensor is one of the fastest ones out there. 
and I, I mounted those, and it's, they're great. But I might end up replacing them for the new ones from GE and their sync line. They have three different sizes of under cabinet lights. They're very diffused. So like with the string lights, you still get a little bit of the concentration and in like the, in like the glare off of like our granite, you can see like the yellow and, and the blue bulbs and stuff that are like intermingling in there in that light strip. But they have these new ones that are nice and long or small depending on your cabinet size and they can all string together. They all work with matter and everything. I thought these were really cool. These might be the new solution for people and they even have ones for inside. Like if you had like clear doors, mount the, they have a different round one that can be recessed into the top of your, your cabinets. I thought these all looked really cool. I don't know if you saw these guys announced at CES, um, but these were pretty sweet. Let's go, um, last question here. Matthew has been looking for a DIY alarm system setup. And they try, they're basically they're trying to find a replacement for the Nest Secure alarm system. And unfortunately in the home kit space, super limited here. And one of the annoying things is, and I don't know, maybe you guys can speak to this from like a connectivity standards point of view on why Apple doesn't allow this, but um, in Apple Home or HomeKit, you cannot use like an Eve door sensor to trigger an Abode alarm system or trigger the um, the Acara alarm system. So those are the two that I know of. Acara and Abode are the two big ones that are out there. Um, but why is it that like you know in like for a security alarm you have to use Abode's sensors or you have to use Acara sensors to make that work? Is there any like technical reason that Apple would maybe try to limit those like that? So I, I don't know if there's a, a, a real technical reason to that. As, as you can imagine, certainly uh, any device that's able to provide that sensor input should be able to communicate um, that information. Uh, that said, in you know having you know I you know I have a long background in Nest and so also worked on the Nest Secure system. Uh, those systems, uh, you know, if you want them to be approved for use with insurance companies and um, you know home security like. Um, live uh, monitoring uh, kind of uh, solutions, those do require uh, certain certifications for them to be eligible for you know, insurance discounts or uh, uh, for use with live monitoring. And um, you know, if, that, that if, if a door and window sensor, for example, is not certified, uh, then that, become, uh, that, that can become a liability, right, in terms of uh, being an input to a uh, existing certified security system. Um, so that that's purely from my Nest hat on. I you know I, I don't know um, what what Apple's reasoning is for that, but uh, that that's kind of my take on it. That's very that's that's good insight for sure. Yeah. Well, is there anything that you guys want to touch on today? I feel like it was a very expansive episode. We talked about a lot of things. I think we covered all the bases here. So thank you again for having us on to give us this opportunity to chat with you about it. Absolutely. Anytime. Um, we're going to link to both the thread blog uh, in terms of the updates. We're going to link to the Apple Insider article too that summarized that thread blog. So everyone's got those resources. Is there anywhere where you would like to point anybody else for uh, following this episode? Uh, no, I think... Uh... Yeah, threadgroup.org uh, is, is the great place to start. Awesome. Well, for everybody else, please go to uh, youtube.com slash HomeKit Insider to watch this episode. Give us all the reviews, 5, 10, 20, 100 stars over on Apple Podcast. Um, make sure you guys subscribe, and uh, we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks again, guys, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for coming.